today we'll, uh, will be a three-part lecture. Uh, I will go through quite quickly the plotting part here uh, because I think the material here is quite self-explanatory. I'm just kind of give you the overview. Then I will do a lecture on object-oriented programming, which is uh, one of the concepts that are quite important in Python. And then I will end off with an introduction to CalFem for Python. So, uh, so that you can start working on, on uh, the first, uh, the second worksheet as well, which uh, involves um, uh, CalFem. So, uh, plotting. So, uh, in, in, in our course, we are going to use a library for plotting called Matplotlib. And it, it has a very close name to MATLAB, and it's uh, kind of the point because it has most of the functions that MATLAB has for plotting as well, and, and also more than that. Uh, you can see here that you have, a, you can click here and go into MATPLOTLIB here. Uh, there is a lot of uh, materials here, and there is also, if you look at examples here, uh, you can go in and see Okay, you can, perhaps you have an idea on what kind of plot you want to do. Then you can go into the examples here and you can find the actual code as well and copy and paste that and use that to modify. So uh, it's a very uh, impressive library and it has a lot of functions for plotting, uh, mostly in, um, uh, in 2D, but it can do 3D as well. So Matplotlib is a large library. It has all a generic drawing API, which is very sophisticated and complicated to learn. But there is a simplified interface which we are going to use in our course, and it's called uh, Matplotlib PyPlot. So this is how you import it in your Python code. So import Matplotlib PyPlot as PLT. So just that we did uh, NP for NumPy, we use PLT for importing uh, Matplotlib. That means that all the commands we're going to use will have the prefix plt. So it's very simple to plot with matplotlib. So in its simplest form, you use the command plot, so plt.plot, and you give it values. In this case, one, two, three, four. Show, uh, you will have to do when you're running it from Visual Studio Code, you always have to call show to get a window. If you use a, a notebook, you don't have to do that, but I, I use show here anyway, it doesn't uh, do anything special. So you can see here that it plots a curve. And if we, if we change the numbers here to something else, you can see that it creates a line, line plot like this. Uh, you can plot both lists and also NumPy arrays. So as we are going to use a lot of NumPy, so we import NumPy as MP. So we have uh, that library available. And we can do uh, simple things here. We can You can create here a range here from zero to pi with a step length here. And then uh, we have an array of x values. And then we can use the mp.sin functions to create a y range for our plot. And then we can just plot x comma y here like this. You can also do x equals to np.lin space. And then we say 100 values here instead, which gives you a, a better range, actually. I don't know why I have it left here. Yep. I don't know if it's important, but I don't think we have the exact same. No. Uh, okay. What what does it? Okay, I can. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I will uh, send you the link somehow here. Um, I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, let's see here. Um, Matplotlib. Uh, 
if you try that link again, hopefully you should have the same as me. Yeah. Yeah. So lean space here uh, instead, because then you get you're guaranteed to have the start value and end value, and then you can set the precision with number of values here as well. And it will give you the same results here when you plot, hopefully. Yes. Uh, you can change the line types by using uh, the, the third parameter of the plot command here. Uh, so the, you, you give it a sequence of characters. So R here in this case is red. O will be that it, you'll use rings instead of lines. So you can see it plots red rings. You can add a dash here. That means blue uh, dots with a dash between them. It's hard to see, but there is a line between them. You can have uh, blue with uh, two dashes here. Then you have a dashed line like this. And you can have pluses here instead of uh, rings. And you can com combine them in different ways. So here I have pluses and a line. Uh, and I think this is very similar to what you can do in math, uh, MATLAB as well. You can have a multiple um, uh, series in the same plot. So in this case, I have sin and cos. And um, then you can just, here you can see this is the first line or series. And then you can see I have the same x basis, but I have y2 instead and a different option here. So you can just list them continuously after each other in the plot command. And now you can see you get both of them in different colors in the same plot. You can also change series properties in, in, in different ways. Uh, one way is that you can add uh, additional uh, arguments here on, on the plot command here that will change the, the appearance of all the series. Uh, so in this case, I will get a thick line instead of for both of the series. If I want to change a, uh, one of the series, uh, I can actually get back from the plot commands uh, the, the series that uh, it has created. So in this case, I have line one, line two. Those are, this is line one series. And the second part here is the second line series. And then I can set properties on individual uh, series here. So here I go line one, set line with four. And line two, I give it eight pixels in, in width. So now you can see you can have different as, um, attributes for each of the series. Uh, you can also uh, get, if you put lines here, you will get a collection of lines. And then you can use the set p command to set multiple properties on all of these series at the same time. So now I, I set line with eight to both of them because I gave it a collection here. Um, a tuple of, of uh, line series, which I then change here um, in the same command. It's also possible to have multiple windows to plot, and that is perhaps more interesting when you run it standalone outside a notebook. So if you run it through Visual Studio Code, uh, figure will bring up a new window with a plot. Running it in, in a notebook here will produce two plots after each other here. So basically two images like this. And if you run it in, in uh, which is the, you will get two windows. You can also combine plots inside a single plot. And you can use the subplot command here, which is uh, has a bit odd syntax. So you, you give it uh, a code here, an integer. that And the first uh, uh, number here, two, is two rows and the second is one column and I want to plot to the first plot of those. And then I can do subplot, same thing, two rows, one column and the second plot. It's a bit odd, but you will see what it means here. So now you can see this is a single plot with two uh, plots in, in the same uh, window or view. And you can see here I have two rows, one, two and one single column. 
And then you can do the other way around, so you can have one, two, one. Then it's one row, two columns, first plot. That is that one. Then it's one row, two columns, second plot. Like this. So now you have them side by side. So it depends on what you want to do. You can combine them in a single window. So one important thing when you do visualization is that you should actually label things and tell, actually put something uh, meaningful text to explain the, the different uh, axes and, uh, and, and titles of the diagram, for example. And that is called decorating plots. So uh, here we have uh, plot x label. That will put a label on the x uh, axis. Y label put a label on the y axis. Why is my... Not sure what happened there. <laughs> um, back here. This is pretty odd. So if I run this one here, you can see here that I have a X axis label here and I have a Y2 and Y1 here on the left side. And if I run, then I can also put texts in the plot here. So you can actually place text in the uh, plot's own coordinate system. Uh, so if I get the coordinates here are actually, um, uh, are actually coordinates in, in the plot itself. So here is n pi minus, minus 2, so it's an 0 0.8 is the coordinate where I place the text. And here you can see also that you can use math notation. Uh, if you are familiar with LaTeX, this is the syntax of LaTeX, so you can put formulas in, inside a diagram. Let's see here. I have to define my So here you can see I put a sin formula directly inside the plot. And this is the formula here. And I, I center it on, on the point here. So 0 0.8 in y direction. Uh, you can also do annotations. An annotation is uh, like putting an arrow pointing to something in the diagram. So if I run this here, you can see here I can put a, a arrow here. And here you can specify x, y uh, for the text and then where it should point to as well. You can also kind of put a window where you want to look at the plot. Uh, so by default, it kind of tries to uh, look at the, um, the series you have. But if you want to zoom into a series, you can use xlim and ylim here to give it a window. So uh, from 0 to n pi and then from 0 to 1. Then you can see here we zoom in on the top here, and then you, you see here that I have the uh, arrow in the same location again. You can also change the scales of the axis here using Y scale here to, to put the logarithmic scale in one direction. And you can see here now you get the logarithmic scale here on that side. And then I finally I will just give, go through some of the examples of other diagrams you can do. You can do Histograms here using the hist function, like this. You can do bar charts, really simple as well. You can do scatter plots. 
you can do contour plots from like this. You can also display images, so uh, you can read an image, and then you can plot that in the diagram as well. Okay, I apparently missing that file, but uh, and then you can do uh, you can put filters on the different images as well to how to want to if you want to have uh, pixels like this or you want to interpolate the pixels in certain ways uh, in the picture as well. You can do uh, flow line visualizations like this. You can do sector diagrams. Or this is a radar plot. And you can also do uh, 3D plots. I'm not sure why this is wrong here. Okay, I will fix this uh, after the lecture. But you can do 3D diagrams as well. So that was a bit about, about uh, matplotlib, and you will use uh, some of the functions in Carlfrim will use matplotlib to actually plot the, the different uh, results that you want to do in this course. So that was matplotlib. Uh, so uh, in this lecture, it will be a short introduction to something that is important to know for uh, using uh, well, using Python Python uh, um, objects and uh, functions already you have no, used already but also when you will do the user interface of this course we'll use a library called Qt and it's extensively ob object oriented and to give you an int overview on what it is uh, I will do a uh, lecture here to kind of explain the concepts of, of the object-oriented program. So, and some the, the, the idea of object-oriented is, is you hear that from the name, you work with objects. So what is an object in programming? So usually objects uh, describe nouns such as point, circle, equation, model, square, and they also um, interact with each other by sending messages. And the messages are the verbs. And you can already see this on when you have used strings in Python, that you have string.split, for example. And the string is an object, and it has a you send a message that they want you want the, the string to split, and it does that. And that is the verb or message. So in Python, we actually don't send messages, but we, we call methods on the object, and that is the same thing. And also the object has something more than just methods, it also has data associated with it. So an object in, in Python or other program language is a combination of data and functions that you can call work on that data. So you have methods, but you have the, the properties, the data, that describes different things on the object. For example, if you have a point, you have x and y coordinates that are belongs to the point. Uh, in, in, uh, to be able to use objects in Python, you need to be able to describe uh, objects. And uh, or kind of design them in a way. And you don't uh, define them directly. You, you need to kind of have a blueprint of how the object should work. And that is what is called a class. So the class is a blueprint of how an object should work, which properties it should have, and which method, methods or verbs you can call on it. So up until now, we have been working uh, with function-based or procedural programming. That means that we have learned how to define functions that operates on input arguments, returns, output variables. And for example, here I have a small function library for manipulating uh, points. So the first function here is used to create the point. So you give a, you call a function, you get back a list of x and y. It's kind of really the simplest form here, and then. You uh, use that uh, point to with the function move point, and you see the first argument here is the point that you want to move, and then you have two arguments here x and y, delta x delta y that moves the point. So it operates on the data structure you put in here and modifies it. You have zero point that will zero the point data structure. You have set the point, 
and your print point. Now you can use it like this. So first we create a point P uh, on 0, 5, and that returns you a, just a list with uh, X and Y. It could be anything. It could be a different kind of data structure as well, but uh, we get that back from the point, and then we can use that to move it. We can use it to uh, assign a new coordinate, and then we can print the point. So in function or program, you kind of separate the data from the procedures of functions. So you have those are separate. Data doesn't know about the function. The function know how to operate on the data, but uh, that's that's kind of idea. Classes. So we can do the same thing with in object oriented programming, but first we need to define a, a blueprint of our point. And that is done through a class. And you can see here, you, you declare a class just like you declare a function. You have the keyword class, and then you have um, declare, okay, what the class name should be. And uh, I use the convention here that class names always start with an uppercase um, letter and then a name, just to kind of differentiate between the normal functions in Python that usually start with lowercase uh, and underscore characters. Uh, to initialize the point when you create it, we need to use something called a constructor. This special function here called init is called when you create a point object. And as this is a blueprint, we don't actually know the, the real object in memory. So the self variable here is actual uh, mimics the actual uh, uh, memory allocated for the object, but we can't know that when we describe the object. So we use self instead of the actual created object. We assign x and y to this object, and we initialize them to zero. So we, all new points will always be at location 0, 0.0. And we run this. So nothing happens here. Now we just defined a new uh, class. We can use this class, class by uh, instantiating it. And that is done by, by calling the class uh, name with a parenthesis. And that will actually call in it also here. So if I do a uh, print here, We can actually also have um, run this here again, and we call this one here. You can see here that it's when you create a new object, it will create called in it, and you can see here that uh, they are not the same. So P is an object of type point, uh, but it has its own memory location. Q is also of the class point, but has another memory location here. I will just remove this here just to not interfere before. Then you can access the, the members of the, prop, prop, uh, the object using the point notation here. So if we print out these two, you can see they are both 0 and 0. You can assign the instant attributes by doing p dot x equals to one p dot y equals to two and you can see there uh, assigning one will won't assign the other one you can see they have different x and y coordinates now uh, the thing is that this is actually not uh, one of the key concept in uh, object oriented program yes yeah, sorry uh, when will we need classes when we need them yeah uh, you will need them when you uh, use uh, uh, the Qt library. Okay. So uh, you you will not need to. You will also also when we implement uh, the computational model, you will implement a class, mm -hmm. which contains all your input parameters. You will have one class that implements the computational model and one that implements the uh, results. Okay. So it, it's a way of uh, organizing your code a bit more higher level than. Uh, uh, functions. But the benefits is that, for example, for computations, you can create an um, input class with all your parameters. You can instantiate multiple versions of these input parameters, and you can loop over and pass them to your computational code 
and do parametric studies very easily. Yeah. So it's an also overview because everything in Python is object oriented. So I'll give you kind of an overview why you need why how it works. But one thing in object oriented is something called encapsulation. So uh, accessing the attributes directly like this is not encouraged. Uh, you should actually access the, pra uh, the properties or the, the properties of a class uh, by methods instead. So we do that by changing our uh, attributes here to self double underscore. That means that x and y are not ex accessible externally anymore. So they are hidden. So they're or called private in other languages. So if we run create this object here and try to access x and y, uh, Python doesn't or, or uh, Python, doesn't, Python, doesn't, Python doesn't like it anymore because they are now private. So we want to be able to implement an object without kind of uh, with the freedom that we can implement the internal mechanism of the object without the user uh, seeing that. So we want, for example, the X and Y could be stored in an external database somewhere, but we want to have the same interface to access them so that the user doesn't know how we have implemented internally. So to be to, to able to access them, you can also see here that uh, if you put an underscore underscore in front of a identifier, you can't access them anymore. It's protected. So then we have to give give it some uh, methods to access the internal value. So we have x and y here uh, as function that we can set uh, the internal values. And then we can have here, you can use set here to set the items and we can have X and Y to assign the internal values like this. And then we also have to have some methods of um, um, returning the values as well. So here you can see how Y as a function that returns the internal here, X to return the X value. And then you can see here that we can, we can both uh, access them, set them, and return them. The thing is in Python here that um, accessing attribute directly is not actually a problem because we can actually implement um, our properties or attributes of a class uh, using something called properties, which gives you the advantages of access just like a dot x equal to something, but with the benefits of we can have the internal control of this automatically. So here I have modified a class again. We have get x, set x, get y, set y, and set. And then at the end of the class here, I add something called a property. And you see here x property get x and set x. So when you use uh, p dot x equals to a value, it will call set x. If we want to get the value, it will use the get x here. That is ha hidden underneath. Your, so a user of your class can just use the attributes directly like this. So p dot x equals to 42, p dot y equals to 84. And what happens now is the magic. So you can see here in the first statement here, p x equals to 42, it calls set x. And then it calls set y. And then if you do print x here, it calls get x. And what we can do with this is, for example, I want to only allow that the user can set uh, values up to, uh, let's see here, 42. So if set x is the x value here, if, uh, so here, now we do it on, on the y side here. Uh, set y, if, Cell uh, value greater than 42. Then we do self What now happens if I try to set y to something greater than 42 uh, it will not it will automatically cap it at 42. So if I run this here again, you can see here that y is 42. 
So by using properties, you can build in uh, safeguards in your code. So you can, you can, for example, check the user if he wants to assign X to something that is not allowed, you can change that in your code. That is not possible doing just having attributes without the functions here, like we have now. So properties is a way of giving the same nice to use interface that we had uh, with the, just the attributes directly in, in the clause. Uh, but using properties, we can actually prevent access to uh, you can change. You can actually check the values for the correct correctness, for example. Uh, another way of doing this is using something called decorators. So, if you don't want to write too much code, you can create properties automatically. So, if you put at property in front of a function called with the same name as the property you want. So, for example, x here returns the x value. Then you do x setter. Then you do the same function here with an x as the variable in here, and you assign it here. That will define a property automatically for you. You don't have to do the declaration of properties below here. So you get the same benefits, but it's easier to implement. You just implement the functions, and then you automatically get, get the properties. So let's continue with our class point here. So now we have enabled it to have a, a X and Y position, but we perhaps we need some functions here to move the point. So, and, and these are called instance methods or methods, uh, also the verbs. So I can tell the point to move, and then I just give it a delta X and delta Y, and then I add internal attributes here with the delta X and delta Y. So here I can create two points, and you can say I can tell the P0 to move 10, 20. I can ask the P1 to move minus 5, minus 5. And you can see here now that the coordinates has been changed. Uh, you can also add uh, methods from, for example, if you have uh, two objects and you want to copy the values from one object to another, you can, do, you, you can implement a copy from function that takes a parameter of another point and then assigns the values of the points to uh, the existing point. And that will look something like this. Uh, so P1 copy from P0. And then you can see here, after the copy here, uh, P1 contains the same values as P0. There are some other uh, interesting method or nice methods to use. Uh, Init is one of them, we already saw that. That is called every time you create a new object, and it's used for initializing the, the, the object state to a, a defined value. But we also have str. And str is a special uh, method that is used when you, for example, if you want to print a, a point, uh, we can see what happens here. If you try to print your own uh, object type or a clause, it will just say main point object at some memory location, which is not so nice. We can add an str method to our clause. And what the str method does is Python will ask your clause, can you give you, me a string representation of our of um, the object? So you, you have to use this special notation here, underscore, underscore, str. And then you return a string representing your object. And you can see if I run this now, you will not get this kind of memory location thing. It will actually print out a nice representation of your object like this. So um, this is a special function you can add to your class that makes it easier to print out. Uh, another thing is that Classes actually access any data type in Python. So uh, we, we talked about lists, and you can add different kinds of objects to lists. You can do that with your own objects as well. So if you create a point, you can add points to the uh, to a list. So here you see I have points here. I create random points and add them to our list. Uh, and I will show you a trick as well that you can do. You can actually uh, condense this this kind of loop here into a single line 
by using a, something called an implicit loop here. So you have this part here is what is called every time you loop here, and it will create a list automatically for you. So this is equivalent of what we did here. And now because I have a print statement in my or print str method in my list, I can actually loop over here and print out all my points. So every time I do print, it will print out um, the actual position of the point. And of course, but it, it's, when you have defined a class, it works just like any other data type. Uh, you can add, as if you assign them, there are references to each other. So P1, P1, P2 will now point to the same memory location as P0, and P3 to the same memory location as P1. Works just like any other data types in Python. You can see these two are the same here. Another benefit of, of object oriented is that you can reduce, if you have a point and you want to create a new object for a graphics library, for example, I want to know, now I want to be able to draw circles. I mean, points are quite boring. Then you can use um, inheritance. So I can say, okay, I want to create a new class, but it should inherit all the properties and methods of the point. Because a circle also has a position. You will also be, you, you want to move that circle. Uh, but we need to add another property to this class uh, radius. So the first thing we do is we, we declare class and we have a parenthesis after it that says, I want to inherit from point. So that this is what this line says. So circle um, inherits all the properties from point. Then we create our own init method here. We add our radius here. But before we can continue our own initialization, we need to make sure that the point is initialized as well. And you do that by calling super. And super gives you a reference to the uh, base class or the class that it inherits from. And then you can call init on that class here. Uh, and then you can do um, assign your own add your own internal attributes. We add our own R property here and setter. We have our own copy from here because we need to also copy the R over from uh, the circle. And then we add a str here as well. So now we can create a point and a circle. And you see that it's basically the same. You give coordinates here and you give um, the radius, but you can see here we didn't have to specify any set points, get points for the coordinates. That's this uh, already built into the circle uh, clause. And you can see here we do assign a radius. We can use move, both of them. Uh, so circle will reuse the move method. And you can see here that I have a one point and one circle here. So inheritance is one way of creating new classes. Another way of creating new classes is to create something called composite classes. And that is like a, you create a car. The car consists of multiple pieces there. I mean, a, a tire doesn't inherit from the base of the car. It's just different pieces together. And the, together, they are a car. Uh, and for example, if you want to create a line, uh, the line uh, goes from two points. So internally, we have... It doesn't inherit from anything. It, it just has two points that we instantiate here in the constructor. And we can access them through the properties like this. And we can print out uh, to and from. And in it way, you can create uh, P1, X, P0, Y. And then you assign the attributes P0 and P1 here when you create them. But one thing here, because the properties here, I only have two properties, and if you don't just give a single property and not a setter, uh, you can't assign P0. So if I try to assign uh, a new point to P0, Python is not happy because you, there is no setter built in. And we can add a setter here as well so that you can set the point. And now we can assign points to the lines here as well.
Then we can, for example, add a method for calculating the length. Uh, uh, you can also define it as a property. Uh, and so this is a property that actually does some calculations before returning. But you can access this just like a property like this, because we have defined this attribute here. I didn't define it, so I have to run this one first. And then we can run it here. Um, so then I will talk a little bit about polymorphism. This is just just that you have heard this term. Uh, and what it means is that if you have a list of different objects, uh, polymorphism makes sure that um, you can you, the right method is called depending on the instance of that object. And for example, if you call a, a, an, an object with a method that is not available in the, the lower class, it will try to find that method in upper class. So for example, that was what we seen with the uh, point move operation. So when we did circle move, move is not available in circle. So Python tries to go up in the hierarchy. Okay, there is a move method in point. And I call that one. That is what polymorphism essentially means. And everything in Python is an object. And even if we didn't specify explicitly, point and circle inherits from the global class in Python called object. So everything in Python, even a line or even a scalar value, uh, integer, string, all inherit from the objects. So what we can do then is we can put them all in a bag, like here. I have a shape bag here, uh, and I just add different things to this, this bag. And then I can loop over all these shapes and print them out. Because, you know, every, every method has, every class has its way of printing to the screen. And we also add it to point and to the, the lines, the print method. Uh, or the, you're using this str uh, special function. So if we run this. You can see here that I, it prints everything out. Uh, and it's, it finds the correct str method to print out uh, what is in the list. So what actually is for when you print 42, what actually happens then? So a floating point value in Python is actually an object itself. So you can actually call methods on that object. So if you see here, print 42 at str, that is actually what happens when you do print 42. It will call str on that and print it out. So you can see here that Everything in Python is an object, and you can use it as an object. Yeah, then you can also see, you can, you can loop over here, uh, point and circle, and you can call move. And, and it will find the correct move method. So it, it see, okay, there's a circle here. Okay, I don't have a move there. It will go to the point. Oh, there's a move. And then I will use that on that object. So that was a really fast overview of object orientation. Uh, after the break, I will uh, do a more visual uh, object-oriented lesson. So you will see how it actually can look graphically as well. So how you can take advantage of object orientation um, in a more visual way. So I will do a pause here. OK, so just to make it a bit more exciting than just looking at text on the screen. I, I'm going to do an object-oriented example that is more uh, visual. So I'm going to use something called uh, Py5, which is a creative programming toolkit for Python, which you can use and install yourself if you want as well. But uh, I'm just going to use it here as a way of showing that you, the benefits of this. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to do a really simple particle system. So basically, things that are bouncing in a, in a box. So uh, spheres that are moving around and bouncing. So uh, what I have done first here is I need to, so all my objects when I'm going to draw them will need some base properties that all objects should have. So for example, uh, the color of the line that it should draw is called stroke color, a stroke alpha, which is if it was going to be transparent. So and fill color for the fill of the object and alpha and stroke width. So I have made an, an, it's called an abstract object. It's an object that we will actually not create directly, 
but it has the base attributes of all objects. So here it has also a draw method. And just to kind of set up the, the attributes before actually drawing. And then it has an on draw method here. So when we create derived objects or objects inherited from drawable base, uh, we will re implement the on draw here. So we will delegate the drawing to the other object after we have set up the, the colors of the object. And you can see also the most useless command of Python. It's called pass, it doesn't do anything. Uh, the reason we have pass is because we can't write empty functions in Python. Because you need you need to have indentation and, and, and a code block to be able to find a function. And if we want to define a function that does nothing, uh, we need to be able to put something there that does nothing. And that is what we have here with pass. So the first uh, uh, class I will implement is, is the particle class itself. So the particle uh, is actually responsible for, for the mechanisms of moving and have, knowing the position. So it's a little like we, we had with our point. So the first thing I want to do is I remove pass here and I create a constructor. Um, it, uh, the constructor of the particle, we, we leave it empty here. And we uh, call our super here because we need to initialize our drawable object as well. And we forgot the colon here, like this. Now we need have, uh, some x coordinates. So we need self. I will not implement any properties in this because I will keep this simple here. So x equals to, uh, okay, I forgot here. I, I needed to implement here self x equals to zero. So we, we, we should be able to create uh, particles with a, a coordinate here. So we assign self x here, self y equals to y. So to be able to have a particle move, we need to have velocity. So we need to define self dot vx for velocity, and we initially put the put them to rest. We don't have any velocity at all. Put it to zero like this. So now I have a basic particle with a position and uh, velocity attributes in x y direction. To move a particle, we need to have a method that can move a particle a step forward in the simulation. So we will add a def update here. And then we have a time step here, so delta t, that we need to kind of put in move a bit. And then we need to calculate a new x position, so self dot x equals to uh, plus equals to, so we add uh, del uh, self dot vx times delta t. Self dot y plus equals to self dot vy times delta t. <coughs> so now the, the particle knows how to move. Uh, it needs to know how to draw as well. So we actually add def on draw. So now we override the method in the drawable base. And we do sketch dot point so now we have a particle can draw we can draw and we will try this out here so here is the main program here the sketch it, it consists of uh, a couple of methods here. the main one is set up it's called once uh, when we run the program and, and draw is, co is called continuously uh, then we do, uh, we just to test here, we create a self dot p equals to particle. We put it at 50, 50. Um, and then we self dot p draw. So now we can call the draw method of the particle. That will first call, because there is no draw method in particle, okay? Where is the next draw method? It's here in the drawable base. It sets the attributes of the particle, calls on draw. But this is empty here, but we have a draw here, so it should draw a point. I, I think it will be hard to see here, uh, but we will just try it anyway. Oh, there it is. 
Ah, there, there is hard to see. There should be a point there, but I'm not sure if it is there. Um, we will we will implement something that's more interesting. So we implement a round particle instead. So we go back here and then we implement this class here instead. And round particle inherits from particle. So we do depth init self x equals to zero, y equals to zero. Uh, and then we do we need a radius here. Uh, Then we do super init again, like we did before, to call the, the base class init self x comma y. Like that. Um, and then we set our like this. Now we need, so now uh, the round particle knows how to move itself. So we need to implement the uh, onDraw for this one. So def uh, onDraw self. And here we do sketch.ellipse. So let's create a round particle here instead. And hopefully we will see that this will run instead. So you know you can see it, it's draw itself. So I have a white uh, rectangle here at 50, 50, and it's 50 something. We can move it some more, 150 here. So you, now, now we have a visual uh, representation of a round particle that we placed on the screen and we can move it around. Next we will need to uh, uh, implement, so if we want to have a box that it should move around in, we need to be able to check if it's in the box, uh, if it's uh, outside and so on. So it's too long to type now, so I will have a, I will copy actually in this clause in here because it's a bit too much to write for a live lecture. But we have a clause here called box boundary, which will have a methods for checking the checking the particle uh, colliding with the uh, borders and also check if it's inside a box. Uh, and what we want to do now is we will want to create a bunch of random particles in our box. Um, so what we need to do in the setup section, we need to create a container for all our particles. So we do self.particles, create an empty list. We do a loop for i in range, let's see, we do 100 particles like this. Then we do, we move up this creation of the particle here, and we put it inside here. But now we want to kind of create them a bit randomly. So we want to uh, we use a random generator here to generate the positions. Self dot uh, random. And then we give also the a radius between self dot random. 30, something like this. And then we append, append our particle to uh, our uh, list. So self.particles. Like this. Uh, also, we need to, uh, of course, specify uh, speed. p.bx equals to self.random and we give it from minus 60 to 60 
like this. Uh, And also we need to give it some nice colors as well. So let's see if we can do p.fill color. Now you see we have the properties of the, the point already, so the drawable base. Um, and then we give it equals two. That is a list of so the colors were specified by red, green, blue, and alpha components. So we have three components here: self.random255. So they go from zero is black and uh, full color 255. And then we have, that's enough. P dot fill alpha equals to self dot. So we don't want to have them completely transparent, but from 50 to 255. like that and then we add them here so now okay we have created a lot of particles so we need to draw them and we can of course do that we go in here and then we'll do for p in self dot particles and then we can just first attempt just p dot uh, draw just test see if it works I didn't save it. Okay. Okay, I will do like this. So I have a lot of particles here. So now you can see every object is its own, has its own colors, its own uh, position, speed, uh, and so on. So okay, we need also to create our uh, boundary box. So we do um, Like that, uh, and now we also need to uh, move our particles. So the thing is that we, we just draw them, but we also need to update them. So what we do then is we do before we draw them, we do p dot update, and uh, Pi Five's uh, window is redrawn sixty times a second. So if we want to call a time step, we do one divided by. 60 frames per second. Let's see what happens now. Nothing. Let's see. So now you see the, the, the particles are moving, but they're kind of moving away from us because we don't check any boundaries in our uh, positions here. So we need to do a boundary check as well. So then we do here, we do um, self.boundary.check p.
So now you can see here that the objects, they are, they are bouncing around and changing positions here. And every object here is its own. Uh, so I, because of it, I could inherit every every object knows how to move itself. It knows how to draw itself. It has its own colors, its own attributes. So I hope that this was more of a visual way of illustrating what it means to do object orientation. Uh, so you, you can actually build in mechanic build in um, functionality inside an object that it knows how to move itself. Um, and we will see that when we do user interfaces later on. Qt is built up of a collection of these objects that you can put together to create a user interface. So for example, a button, a checkbox, are objects, you have a window that is an object, and you create all this and connect them together to an application. So this you can add, uh, for example, try it yourself to add gravity or uh, attractors. Um, Support, so, so you can really do a, a particle system. If you have gravity, every every particle will drop down to the floor here. Uh, so now they are moving in in weightlessness. You can do collision detection to check if particles collide with each other. Uh, and you can build that into uh, this uh, boundary clause as well. So that was... Uh, what I wanted to show here. And, and Pi5, you can install. I would recommend not installing Pi5 inside your BSM N20. Create a new environment where you install Pi5. Then it doesn't interfere with anything you're doing in this course. But it's really fun library to, to uh, look at. And there's a lot of examples of different things you can implement with it. And it's just set up and draw. So set up is called once, draw is called continuously all the time. So that was a bit about um, object orientation. So now let's get back to our finite element coding again. So, Carl for Python. Uh, you probably already used Carlfen for MATLAB, and Carlfen for Python uh, was actually developed many years ago for actually for being able to in this course uh, use Python uh, for everything. Before we actually used another language for implementing the finite element code, but we wanted something that connected to the other courses we had. So we had a master thesis work the worker that actually re-implemented a lot of the Colfin functions. And then we have continued to develop on that. Um, so now we have, I will say 95, 96% of all the MATLAB functions are available in Python. Uh, instead of, so it uses NumPy for, for uh, its matrices and arrays. Uh, what is not uh, available in MATLAB Colfin is the mesh generation routines that we have here. So I will go through that in the next lecture, how to generate meshes in Carlfem. But it can take a geometry and generate elements in that geometry depending on criteria like maximum area and so on. So you can get uh, uh, different densities of elements in, in a geometry. It also uses uh, plotting for matplotlib. So a lot of routines here will use matplotlib for, for plotting. And here are some of the modules that are available. So you have carlfem.core. Uh, that contains all the element routines, uh, system functions like Solvec, uh, ASM is also part of Calfem core. So everything that is basically not plotting routines. Uh, and then we have Calfem utils. There is a lot of utility functions for writing fi uh, things to uh, I.O., um, printing, and so on, so in utils. Uh, Carlton geometry is for defining geometry. We will go through that in the next lecture. Um, you define lines and points, and then you use that as input for the Carlton.mesh routine, the mesh module, which will generate uh, EDOF topology coordinates for you automatically. Uh, so you don't have to to do the mesh by yourself. It's only in the first worksheet or second worksheet that you will do manually do the mesh for six points or four elements. 
in the worksheet number three, we will do use the mesh routine to generate larger meshes. Carlfilm.vis uh, on Carlfilm BIS MPL, which is a specific one we were we will be using, uh, is the visualization library. So it contains all the functions for visualizing the results of of, of Carlfilm. Uh, you probably already did this in um, in your own environment. So pip install Carlfilm Python. I will do this here as well. It will take a bit of time. So what I'm doing now, as I, in this uh, cloud notebook, it will do the same installations that you did locally. So most of the things I'm be talking about now will be something that you probably have seen before, uh, because it's very similar to uh, the MATLAB version of Carlfilm, but you will see some differences. Yeah. So the general procedure for a finite element calculation: you define the model, you generate the element matrix, you assemble the element matrix into the global stiffness matrix, you solve the system of equation, and then you calculate the element forces. So let's start really simple with a system of springs. We have a spring with 2k here and one spring with a k and then 2k and a load applied in the middle. We describe discretize the model here and introduce some degrees of freedom. So we have one, two, and three degrees of freedom here. Very simple. Three elements, one, two, and three. And first thing we have to do is import uh, the libraries we require to solve the problem. So we have NumPy. We have Carlfilm Core as CFC, Carlfilm Bis MPL as CFB, and then Math. Um, and then we run this. Ignore this matplotlib things. It's it's not uh, just it's just for information. First thing we have to do is define the topology array. And here is one one thing that is actually similar to MATLAB. So uh, Carlfilm for Python does not use zero-based indexing. So if for topology. So uh, if you want to define degrees of freedom, we use the same uh, concept as in, in uh, CalFem. So we start with one, two, three, and so on. We don't start, we don't give the degrees of freedom uh, with the zero, starting with zero. So we have element one goes from one and two, element two goes from two and three, element three also from two and three. So we, there's a shared node there. So if you print that out, so you can see here, we got this array here. Then we create the stiffness matrix, uh, K, with 0, 3 by 3, and a, and a force vector, 3 by 1. Looks like that. We create our element matrices, or also the material properties here. here. So we K equals to 1500, and then EP1 is K, and EP2 is 2K. And then we create CFC.spring E. So this is very similar to what we have in MATLAB, same element. It returns you uh, um, element matrix, and we only have two different element matrix here, so we can reuse one of them. And then we do uh, ASM, and we use EDOF here as the input. Uh, and here you can see I use so arrays is always zero uh, index zero based, uh, but just remember that the degrees of freedoms are not zero based. So, but the actual arrays is always zero based in Python. So that's why we use e of zero comma colon, so that row one comma colon, and we assemble them into K here. And here's also one difference is that we don't need to return anything on the left side here when we do assem, because we will assemble K E2 in place into the K array. And you can see here it worked. Then we need to solve the equation system. We need to define boundary conditions. We have um, two of them uh, on degree of freedom one and degree of freedom three. So we specify here B, C, R, A, one and three. Here we also specify with one based indexing, but not for the load because load is an array and you need to specify um, 
the actual index in the Python array, which is zero base. So in this case, it should have been two, but it's one. And then we assign a force to that uh, in, in the force vector. And then we use solvec. And here is the same syntax again. So we put k, f, and the boundary condition vector. And in Python, we have actually two components of the boundary condition vector. So we have the BC, uh, we can look at the, we can see here we have a BC prescribe here, which contains the degrees of freedom that we want to prescribe. And we have a second vector here, which is BC value, which is the value we want to prescribe. If you don't, if you just give the one, it will set zero to the values. So, but if you want to specify a certain value, you need to also do BC val here like this. So you will need to add uh, another array containing the values. But in this case, we, we don't do that. And then we run this. And you can see here we have reaction forces here and we have a displacement here. So that was the uh, first part here. Then we can calculate the, the displacements here by calling, uh, extracting the element displacement for each of the elements here using the LDISP function. And then we can calculate this, the forces in the springs here as well. Like that. That was a simple example. So let's increase the difficult level now. So now we have a, a thrusters here, uh, fact back, uh, fixed here in three positions with the load acting here below. Um, and then we have degrees of freedom here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we have element one, two, and three like this. We create a EDOF matrix again. And here, oh, I forgot to mention it. In um, Carl Fan from MATLAB, the first column is the element number. We have not used that in Python. So uh, it's only the degrees of freedom here. So one, two, five, six, five, six, seven, eight, three, four, five, six. So the element numbers are kind of given by the order of the EDOF matrix that so we have ignored that column it was a bit redundant. Then we have eight degrees of freedom. So we have a stiffness matrix of eight by eight and a force vector of eight by one. Like that. We define some material properties like this. Uh, we do uh, uh, store them in element properties like this. So E A1, E A2, because that is what the element function will take as input. We define element coordinates. Uh, we could have just used lists here if, if, if we want, but we are thorough here. So we do MP array 0 to 1, 6, EX, EX2 and X3 and EY, Y coordinates. And now we have everything to create our element matrices. And here we do bar to E, EX1, EY, EY1, EP1, K2, and so on. This works because we only have three elements. I, I will get to some um, bit better way of doing it in the next example. We assemble them, assemble them again in the same way as, as like we did before. And then we do solve the equation system. Now we have uh, actually uh, six boundary conditions prescribed. So the actual uh, equation system will actually be a two by two because it's uh, the, the things that this reduces a lot of it. And then we do F6 is six degrees of freedom is 80. And then we solve the equation system. And we got a displacement in just two of them, which should be correct. And we have reaction forces in, in four parts of the frame. So that should also be correct. Then we calculate the element displacements and calculate the element forces here as well. So this, this method of solving is, is kind of works for four or five elements perhaps, but we need to figure out a, a more efficient way of doing this if we want to have larger systems. So in this case, we have a larger truss here 
uh, with, uh, let's see here, 10 elements. And you can see all the degrees of freedom. So we have some materials. We have a force acting at 30 degrees here. So now we have an EDOF matrix that is a bit bigger. We have uh, 12 by 12 degrees of freedom. Define some, um, we have the same element materials in all elements, so we use one single EP. We have EX coordinates here. Now, uh, and we just, I try to format it better so you can read it more easily. EX, EY. And now we want to kind of uh, efficient uh, loop over and do the assemblation more autom in, in, in an automated way. So here I will use the zip function here to be able to loop over uh, EX, EY, and EDOF, because that is what we need to assemble the element into the stiffness matrix. And here you can see I put ELX is the element X uh, row in the EX, and then L topo here is the, the row in the EDOF matrix, and you will loop over uh, all of these arrays at the same time. Then we can do KE equals to CFC bar to E, and then we put ELX, ELY, EP is the same, so we can have the same variable there. L topo, assembly, and with K comma KE. So now, now this uh, method can be used on any size of elements. Then we do the same thing here again. We, we calculate our forces here uh, by using some math functions here, and then we we also don't have any boundary conditions with specific values. We can just do one, two, three, four, and then we solve it. And now we need also to have an efficient way of calculating the element forces the other way around. We don't do that one element by element. So we do uh, we use extract LDISP here to extract element displacements. So you can see here if I put EDOF and AE here, it will create an array. Uh, of uh, one row per element with its displacements. We create an um, array for storing our element forces. <clears throat> and then we do the same thing with the zip function here again. So we zip over EX, EY, and ED, because that is what we need to be able to calculate uh, the element forces. Then we put in ELX, ELY, EP again, because that is the same for all elements, and element displacement for that element. And then I do this is a bit odd because the newer versions of NumPy, if you have an array that is a single element, uh, you, you would think that you can use that as a scalar, but you can't. It, it complains, you get error message all the time. So if you want to get an scalar out of a single element you can use dot item and then we run this and we compute all the element forces here like that so now we have a generalized the solver here in Calfem to to be it, it can in principle, handle any size of problem now. Uh, and that's what, what, what you're going to use later on when you have the mesh generation. It will generate the topology for you, the coordinates, the EX and EY, and you can plug it into your own solver. Uh, okay, we do another one here. We raise the complexity level again. So now we have beams, and we have three degrees of freedom in each node, but we also have bars. So this is an example of how you can combine beams and bars in a single problem. And now we are going to use um, coordinates and DOFs here. So there is, there is another way of, of you, that you provide coordinates and the degrees of freedom per coordinates instead of um, EDOF directly. So you, then you have coordinates are the same for all the nodes. Then we have one set of degrees of freedoms for uh, when we have three degrees of freedom per node and one for the nodes that have only two degrees of freedom. So DOF1 is for uh, connecting the beams and, and DOF2 is for connecting the, the bars. Then we create the EDOF matrix here for the beams. You can see you have one, two, three. So, so we have 
three plus three because they, a beam connects to uh, three degrees of freedom in each side. And then we use uh, the chord extract function, which takes the EDOF, chord and DOF, and creates the EXY and EXY uh, arrays for you automatically. Because you don't have to specify EXY and EY2. You do the same thing for the bars here, EDOF2, and then you create EX2, EY2, which is the element coordinates for the bars. Then we have to assemble in two steps because we have beams and bars and there are different commands. So we first we loop over all the beams, assemble the beams. We loop over all the bars and assemble the bars. Now we can solve the entire equation system here again um, using the PC prescribed and MP array here uh, and solve the system here. Uh, I don't uh, have the other one. I think we had. There are finished examples of this in, in the examples in, in the code as well. Um, I think I did this when I didn't have the visualization routines ready here yet, but I, I will update this well. So that was an introduction to CalFem. So in, in the worksheet number two, you will pick one of the problems, uh, uh, either the plane stress problem or the groundwater or the temperature problem. Uh, implement uh, so there are examples for each of the problem which contains four elements uh, and create a model for those and, and uh, use CalFem to actually assemble and solve those problems. So in this first worksheet we will do the mesh generation manually and next time but but the solver should be able to the solver we create now should be able to handle uh, when we generate a large mesh as well. So think about this looping over a SIP to, to assemble the functions uh, automatically and also to calculate element forces uh, automatically in loops. Uh, and then uh, the worksheet also, I can, I can bring up the worksheet here just to show you here. Worksheet number two. Uh, so you will implement uh, four classes in this uh, worksheet. Uh, you will get very clear instructions here, so you don't have to invent anything from scratch. So I will give you some hints how to start. But model params is the class that store all the input variables for your problem. Uh, and you will give that to the solver, which will store, uh, will read from that object the parameters and solve the problem. You will also create a model result class where it will hold the results of the calculation. So when the so the solver actually will have two parameters, one model input uh, or model parameters and one model result. And so it will the results will be written to these objects. So, and then you can uh, easily store them somewhere else and you can do parameter studies uh, easily. So the solver should not have it doesn't have the, the input parameters directly. It will retrieve them from, from the model params class. So here you can see in the model params we define, for example, the thickness or the element properties, set up the coordinates here for the problem. Model result class will contain A, R, E, D, Q, S, Q, T, and so on, depending on your problem. Here we assign them none here just because we uh, indicate that there is no result yet but the, the variable is still there. So we can check if A is none, we can check, okay, there is no result yet. So that's why we, we put none here. This looks kind of strange, but then the variable exists and you can check for it. Um, the solver class will take, you can see here, model parameters as input, model results as also as input, and store them internal here. And then when you, uh, calculate here, execute, you can you can uh, assign temporary names here to make it more easy to use. And then when you are done, you store the results here in the model results object. Then there is also model report, which is used to print a nice report over the results. And then you have a main program here as well. So at the end, you will have something like this. You have 
uh, in the main program, you will start by creating a model params object. You will create a model, re model result object. Then you create a solver. You pass along the model params and model result into this. You execute the solver. Then you create a report, which also takes the model params and model results as input. Because to make the report, you both need the input and the results. So that is actually essentially the first worksheet. To be able to create these four classes, put them together, and run it. And my my advice is not to perhaps rush into implementing all the classes, but try to implement the solver first without the, all the classes here. Just a call from solver for your problem. And then you know how to, then you move that into the, the model solver class later. So it's easier to just make the solver first and then implement the, the classes later. So here's an example how you can look when you run, run it. Something about also reading and writing to JSON. Uh, but that's basically it. So here, here are the different element types. So we have a plate element. We have a two-dimensional heat flow element, a groundwater flow element. And then we have the, the example problems here. Uh, so you here you have, you have four elements. And the same thing for two-dimensional heat flow. You have four elements here as well. And you have groundwater flow here as well. And I will also uh, print out some example results so you can compare to. So when you do the calculation, you can see if you're in the same ballpark as what it's supposed to be. So that is the worksheet. Don't worry too much about the object orientation. I, I will I mean the, the examples here basically go through beginning to end of defining your, your models. Your model classes. Uh, before we end here, I also wanted to uh, uh, shortly show an example of how to use uh, the debugger in um, Visual Studio. So just kind of um, let's see if we take. So if we have the example we show here, the object oriented pro program here. Uh, you can cr click here out in, in this uh, area here. There's a red dot here. So if I put a click here, there's an even more red dot here. Then I click on the arrow, but not the arrow, but the drop down here. Then you can do debug Python file. When you run this code now, you can see here that uh, the, the environment changes a bit. And now it didn't stop. <laughs> um, that is a bit strange. Let's try again here. Yeah, this is how it should have looked like. So you can see here that I put the breakpoint there. And if I run it here, you can see that uh, um, it stopped here with a yellow arrow here, and here you can see all the variables that we have defined. So if if you step here, on top here you can see you have uh, continue that will continue to run. You can step over that will run one step in your code. Uh, you can step into that will go into the function. You can step out to then it will go out of the function. You can stop. You will also see here that it created the sketch variable automatically, so you can see what variables you have in your code to the left here. I would suggest trying it out because if you have some problems when you don't you get stuck, you can actually put the breakpoint before something happens and you can step through the code and see what happens. It's actually a very valuable tool when you have you can't find your errors. If you stop you go back again to the normal here. So Python debugger, debug Python file. But you need to you need to have a, a breakpoint somewhere in your code for it to work. That was everything for today. Uh, I put the deadline for the, the worksheet one is this week. I, I will put, um, I think it's after Easter, you will get the next one for the worksheet uh, two. So you have some time to work on the worksheet two as well. Okay, any questions?